Tonight on KTN Prime. Dog meat for dinner. The horror of Turkana famine. The standard gauge railway project must and will go ahead for us to achieve our developmental agenda. No reverse gear. Uhuru stands his ground on the railway project. A time to go. Embu governor impeached over alleged nepotism. And punishing the poachers. A Chinese man is fined 20 million shillings. to this edition of KTN Prime. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nancy Kachingira. Welcome to the program. I'm Ben Kitili. Tonight we begin with what has become a harrowing annual ritual for residents of the county of Turkana. That's right. Several families have now resorted to eating dog meat as famine continues to ravage the vast county. Officials there say at least 30,000 people have fled to neighboring Uganda to escape the famine. Now, as it should be, that is our big story tonight. And we're going to start our coverage with senior North Rift reporter Mercy Kandier, who is in Turkana. The two women from Kakuma area in Turkana West had had enough. In the name of hunger, they ate dogs, the only resort they say they had. We found that they have roasted two puppies. They, they convinced to us they had eaten two, and they have roasted two, and the one was ready to be taken the following day. 10,000 residents in Turkana West alone are in dire need of food. Among them is Akai Emokua, a widow whose husband was killed by the Toposa bandits. Akai has lost three of her children. According to her relatives, they died because they had no food. So she traveled to Kakuma refugee camp to at least get food for her two remaining children. She too confessed of eating dog meat. <laughs> Akai is part of the internally displaced persons that moved back to Turkana after the post-election violence. The group used to receive relief food from the government. The last three months have seen them receive absolutely nothing. That, coupled with harsh climatic conditions, makes it hard for these IDPs to survive here. But for the rest, in line with their nomadic culture, they crossed borders to neighboring Uganda. Most of our animals, if not all, are across the border. So those who remain behind are people who are vulnerable. Around uh, 30,000 people, they are there with the animals and they are taken care, the, their security is taken care by the Uganda security. The dust proves too much, not only for our car, but for the villagers too. Nakurio village in Turkana Central is almost deserted. Empty manyatas as the wind blows, going with any hope of any rain. Many have left their homes in search of food and pasture. The drought, now like a shadow, befalling the county annually, leaving a region to be dependent on food aid. The doors of the houses here are made from recycled containers of relief food. Akuna size ka kwa hiyo nyumba. Akuna hata jana, hata leo. Akuna. When villagers resort to eating ayongol, a wild fruit, then you know the drought has hit hard. The fruit that grows during the dry season becomes a daily meal here for both the young and old. 
this as the county government seek long-term solutions. But the short-term solutions, especially for the elderly, remains the goodwill of fellow villagers who once in a while give a helping hand. Many of the elderly sit under the shade of the houses away from the scorching sun. But nothing much can be done to escape the hunger pangs. And as we continue to cover the story, this man comes with his identification card, thinking it's the government with relief food. We disappoint him. Recently, just some two weeks ago, we had a meeting. A DSG met at the county level. And then they come up with some strategies on how best we can provide food to the needy. Among the long-term solutions include convincing residents to reduce the number of livestock they keep, a tough one for a region whose pride is in the number of livestock they keep. And when the day is done, tomorrow, the county wakes up knowing they will have to find ways to survive. Drought that hits Turkana County annually may be inevitable, but it is quite clear that the national and county government need to find solutions fast to this annual catastrophe. For those who feel the pinch of it most are the elderly, especially like Nangole here, who can't walk for miles to search for food. Masi Kandie KTN, Kalotum Village, Turkana Central. That was Mercy Kandia reporting on the dire situation in Turkana, and we will be speaking to her again later on in this bulletin. Now, amid the raging famine, several leaders from the region are now accusing the county government of failing to coordinate relief operations in the area. They spoke to KTN in Loima a few hours ago. There's some food which the national government they have sent to this county, about 47 bags, uh, 47, 4700 bags of maize and uh, three bags of beans for each sub county, seven sub counties, that's 18 bags and some uh, cooking oil. All that, to date, we are, that food it is still in the Lodua cereal board. There's no money for transportation of this food. The reason is, the county government they are saying they have even a, they don't have even a point to, to, to transport this food to the destination. All that I'm uh, appealing, I am appealing the national government that whatever it has provided now is not enough. We came to the county government to ask if really they go their money, but to our astonishment, to our dismay, the county government said they do not, they have not received anything like that, and they keep up to now. They will tell you they have never received that money. So the fate of the Turkana people has remained between the national government and the, and the, and the, and the county government because none of them wants to accept. From the happenings in Turkana that we are reporting tonight, you can, uh, SM, you can get in touch with us via social media platforms on Twitter. You can use the hashtag Save Turkana. Hashtag Save Turkana. Tell us what you think about the dire situation in the northern county of Kenya. Let's now bring in the governor of the county of Turkana, that is Josphat Nanok, who is joining us live on phone from the county of Turkana. Governor, it is, uh, it is not nice what is happening in the county of Turkana. It is happening again. Uh, we are reporting uh, 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 people who have had dog meat due to the farming that is ravaging that particular county. What, what is happening there, governor? Joe, thank you, uh, and it's good for me to call in now. Uh, five months ago, we, after a series of uh, consultations with partners and, and assessments that we had conducted, we declared an emergency in Turkana, and we began effort to mobilize partners and ourselves to provide uh, food and water and medicine. And uh, this is something we've been continuing with. Also, at a very low phase, we've been tankering water, we've been buying off food from uh, the local market, but taking care that we don't buy off everything such that we create an artificial shortage. Uh, but there are also challenges we've been experiencing, particularly the National Cereal Board. Now, Governor, National... Governor, three members of Parliament, including uh, James Lomenen of Turkana South, uh, Nicholas Ndikor of Turkana East, and uh, uh, Kuja Prota of Loima are accusing you of failing to coordinate relief, uh, relief 
efforts in the county of Turkana to avert this situation. What is your what is your response Joe, to that? Joe, Joe I, you can't accuse me of nothing because the food sitting in the cereal board is being managed by the Ministry of Devolution. We have asked them to release the food even for sale. We buy it. They have said they are not selling any food to us. Second, we ask them to release the food for us to distribute, and they have said they are not distributing. They, they are not releasing the food to us to, to, to distribute. So what we have done now is that we are making arrangement to go down to Kitale and Eldoret to purchase food direct from farmers because it looks like somebody somewhere in Nairobi wants to play politics with this food. So, so what you're saying is that the money is there, but uh, you cannot access the food because the, uh, those leaders, those three members of parliament are saying that uh, the money is, is, cannot be accounted for, and it was given by the uh, Ministry of Special Programs to be able to deal with this particular uh, calamity because it was foreseen by the Meteorological Department. So you are saying that the money is there. Ministry, Ministry of Devolution. I said Ministry of Devolution. You know, government processes work in a way that National Cereal Board can only release from the Strategic Grain Reserve based on a letter on a release letter that is coming from the permanent secretary or the cabinet secretary of the ministry uh, of the relevant ministry. That has not been done to date. Now, uh, what is happening is that uh, the ministry itself is, is beginning a relief distribution using the chief system tomorrow in areas where we were distributing food two weeks ago. Totally disjointed uh, way of doing it. So, Governor, what are you doing on your end as a county government of Turkana to be able to correct this situation? So what I'm saying is that I have been in discussion with the Cabinet Secretary Anwar Igoro. I have been in discussion with the PS Congela, with the partners on the ground. And now we are also moving, since we cannot access the food that is sitting in cereal board, what we are now doing is we are calling an emergency uh, meeting tomorrow of my cabinet and we will be procuring food direct from the farmers themselves. Thank you, Governor. That is just for Nanok, the governor of the county of Tukana, speaking to us live on phone from the county of Tukana. That is our top story tonight where uh, famine is continuing to ravage the county of Turkana. Let's now bring you uh, s some of the details, uh, some of the history, part of the history of the county of Turkana as far as famine and the drought episode is concerned. This dates way back to 1925, but the first major drought in this particular part of Kenya happened in 1952, in which 61% of livestock in that particular part died. Then almost a decade later in 1960, another big drought happened in Turkana, where 55% of livestock which is the main livelihood of the population there, died. And then in 1970, 54% uh, of livestock in that particular part of the uh, country died following yet another big drought. Now, according to government statistics, is that uh, livestock rearing, of course, in the form of pastoralism is the main uh, source of livelihood in that particular county, that particular part of the country, 60%, more than 60% accounting for that particular uh, population. Now, 1980, another big drought happened in Turkana where 65% of livestock in that particular part of the country died. In 1990, again, another big drought uh, still uh, led to another food crisis in Turkana. 53% of livestock died. Then in 2000, 63% of livestock was killed from another drought. Now, in the last 10 years in the last decade there have been drought episodes in 2001 2003 2006 2009 and latest in 2011 it happened between uh, mid 2011 to mid 2012 this is the most memorable one which of course uh, led to mortality rates among all species of livestock in that particular part of the country to rise from 6.2 percent to 9.77 percent it was uh, it ravaged uh, the entire Horn of Africa. It was known as, it was said to be the biggest uh, drought in 60 years, uh, leading to a food crisis across uh, Somalia, Djibouti, Ethiopia, and of course, in Turkana here in Kenya, leading to that very famous Kenyans for Kenya campaign, which galvanized the nation as Kenyans uh, 
raised funds to be able to help their starving countrymen. That uh, particular campaign, of course, uh, managing to garner more than 600 million Kenya shillings. That was almost two and a half years ago, Nancy, and here we are again today. Of course, yes, Ben, the question has to be asked, weren't there mid- and long-term solutions being looked at? Because, just like you said, once again, we are facing a crisis. Exactly, that money was for both for immediate relief, mm -hmm. food, and for viable long-term solutions to be able to address food security in that particular account. Now, the question is, was that money used wisely? Where are the long-term solutions? And of course, you can weigh in on this discussion. Use the hashtag SavingTukana on Twitter. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Now, as we did mention, this famine is only the latest in a region that has witnessed at least 28 major droughts in the last century. But now it is emerging that the government was warned repeatedly by various organizations that the famine would come. So just what will it take to save Turkana from the annual agony? KTN's Wilkes Tanyabwa spoke to several experts and now reports on some of their insights. Turkana is hungry, yet the faces of hunger staring out at the world remind the country of other years and other famines that have brought the region to its knees. In 2011, it was reported that 3.75 million people in 13 districts were facing hunger as the worst famine in 60 years swept over the Horn of Africa region. Children grappled with malnutrition and thousands of cattle died. Kenyans, moved by the plight of the starving, banded together under an initiative dubbed Kenyans for Kenya. The target was an ambitious one billion shillings. The funds would be used to feed the hungry while setting up long-term projects in order to ensure food security in the region. This is the oil from Gambia, oil in the Turkana basin. The next year brought good tidings to the people of Turkana. Oil deposits were discovered in the county. Later, a huge water source was discovered in Turkana, enough to supply the country for 70 years. The government announced plans to tap the water and use it to irrigate the land and produce food. The food situation there is heartbreaking. To see on one end or in Turkana, people dying of hunger, and the other end where irrigation has started, there's lots of food just about to be harvested in a few weeks' time. And that tells us they have productive soils. The only issue we need to sort out largely is the issue of water. Actually, Trukana holds the key to our food security. If only we can tap into that potential. They are vast land. There are people willing to work. And they have the most scarce resource everywhere, water. Can we begin tapping into this and making maximum use of it? But tapping the water requires an infusion of funds and months down the line, Turkana is hungry again and the finger pointing is just beginning. A section of analysts blame the government for failing to use key information provided by various bodies tasked with sounding the alarm. The Metrological Department allegedly warned in October that Turkana was likely to face drought after the short rains failed. The National Drought Management Authority says it has been working to avoid a situation similar to that experienced in 2011. We need to listen because for those who listened are reaping the fruits. For those who didn't listen right right now are suffering and therefore as a country and as individuals we need to change our behavior to what we are told we need to be more we need to take action and do what is needful rather than speculate and try to assume and yet the information we're trying to rely on is not based on any scientific facts those who subscribe to a different school of thought point out that it is difficult for government services to reach Turkana residents given that they are scattered across a wide area. These analysts suggest that the pastoralists move closer together, an undertaking that is difficult owing to the nomadic practices of residents in the region. A Vision 2030 report compiled by the Planning Ministry under former Minister Wycliffe Oparanya appeared to acknowledge the challenges facing Aritri 
regions, it suggested that drought periods should be anticipated and managed and observed that drought represents a failure in development, meaning that the country's drought response is still not timely. It then proposed the establishment of a national drought contingency fund linked with the National Drought Management Authority so that resources are available at the time they are most needed. Yet as the year begins, 120 villages in Turkana are hungry again, begging the question, has the government failed Turkana? Wilkistanyabwa, KTN. That is the top story. We are continuing to keep an eye on for you. Remember to keep uh, informing us what your views are on the same. The hashtag on Twitter is Save Turkana. In other news, the Standard Gauge Railway project will not stop. A categorical president, Uhuru Kenyatta, made the announcement this afternoon. Even as two parliamentary committees continue investigations into the multi-billion shilling project, critics of the tendering process have grown in recent weeks. But as KTN's Edith Kimani reports, the president has dismissed them as noisemakers, asking those with concrete evidence to come forward. With his cabinet behind him, President Uhuru Kenyatta made a show of a united government as he announced that the controversy surrounding the Standard Gauge Railway project was not going to stall the multi-billion shilling vision. We are open to resolving any conflicts in this matter. For indeed, there comes a time and an hour when we must stop the noise and work must begin. But the question of who does the work has been at the heart of criticism over the project. You cannot have the same contractor giving you the, the story of a feasibility study, the design, costing bill of quantities, then you are, sub, you are, you are giving the same contractor uh, the contract. What has been happening is you're hearing that accusation produced, and I think I even said it in my statement, give me something that says this is wrong. A, B, C, D, E. The Jubilee government also inherited the funding headache. The exact contract cost has been the subject of much debate with as much as 1.3 trillion shillings quoted as the amount needed to steer the project. <laughs> Ya kwamba, total ni 1.6 plus 1.6 is 2, ndiyo? Inakuja 3 point ngapi? 3.2 billion. Money that will come from the Exim Bank of China. President Uhuru Kenyatta has been categorical that this project is one of national interest. What he did not mention, however, which does touch on national interest, is how it will affect Kenya's current debt burden. The latest Treasury report shows that Kenya currently owes 1.8 trillion shillings, with observers warning that more loans, even for such major projects, will stunt development in the country. However, even with these concerns, the President's stand is unshaken. The Standard Gauge Railway project must and will go ahead for us to achieve our developmental agenda. A position that previously divergent cabinet members now agree on. Edith Kimani, KTN. So there you have it. The president has spoken out on the standard gauge railway issue. But the question we're asking you this evening is, do you think that President Uhuru has actually adequately addressed the issues that are surrounding the standard gauge railway controversy? Again. Tell us what you think. SMS your yes or no response to the number 22155. You can tweet us at Ben underscore Kitili at Kachungira and at KTN. Kenya shall be sampling those views plus your comments about the Turkana farming during this live newscast. So, the president has moved in to try and calm the country down over the explosive standard gauge railway tender, as we just told you. Okay, Wilson Buru now traces the genesis of the controversy and why the mind-boggling numbers are tripping everyone, including the head of state. Controversies have been threatening to derail the standard gauge railway project from the start. Most of the questions have arisen from the process followed in the tendering and exactly how much the entire project will cost. 
The storm over the rail tender began when a section of politicians began a push to persuade the president not to launch the project on grounds that there were questions to be answered about the tendering and the company awarded the tender. Nandi Hills Member of Parliament Alfred Keter would later tell a parliamentary committee that he had documents proving that the cost was inflated and that there was also a breach of procurement laws in the award of the tender. Kenya should have done a study to come up with the costing. Kenya should have done a study with an independent body. Let us follow due diligence to arrive at a good report. Let us have a study. Then we subject the contract to the rule of law. And then last week, things came to a head when the Jubilee politicians, led by their two leaders in the Senate and the National Assembly, gave the president an ultimatum. We want to tell the president, the deputy president, like this. Wale hawa uyo uyo mtu, hawa hawa wawili hapo hapo hawa watiaku. Wenye wanajaribu kujificha kwa marinda ya serikali. Hapo tu wanalala hapo kwa marinda ndio wale tangi kichu. Lazima muatimue kabla ya wiki moja. La sivyo, sisi wanavunge tutatimua hawa. Uhuru's government must give a statement regarding the architects of Angolism who are now using the same trick to come into the railway tender wakule pesa na wa Kenya wasijengewe really the idea to build a standard gauge railway was conceived during President Mwangibaki's tenure. Then, in August last year, five months after taking office, President Uhuru Kenyatta flew to China in his first diplomatic mission and secured agreements worth 425 billion shillings. In the initial report, it was indicated that some 340 billion shillings would cover economic partnerships, wildlife protection and the standard gauge railway linking the port of Mombasa and the border town of Malaba. Conflicting reports have then emerged ever since, with the confusion surrounding the exact total cost of the Kenyan stretch of the standard gauge railway. Total 1.6 plus 1.6 is 2. Yeah. And I go just 3 point gap you. 3.2 billion. Na hiyo ni approximately 327 billion. Huh? 320 3.804 billion Kenya shillings. The president's announcement that the construction of the standard gauge railway will continue as scheduled is by no means the end of the controversy that has dogged this project. Only time will tell whether this turns out to be another mega corruption scandal or the best thing that has happened to the railway sector in this last half a century. Wilson Buru, KTN, Nairobi. Next tonight, Embu Governor Martin Wambora could go down in history as the first governor to be impeached under the devolved government. Embu County Speaker Justice Karyuki Mate dismissed a court order blocking the impeachment, saying that the court order papers were not authentic. As the situation stands now, the Embu... Uh, I beg your pardon, the Embu governor now only has one thing standing between him and impeachment. KTN's Catherine Omwando has more on this developing story. Martin Wambora will be a household name for the next couple of months as he becomes the first governor to be voted for impeachment by his county's assembly. They want him impeached for alleged corruption. By this evening, the Embu County Assembly had resolved to remove their governor, Martin Wambora, after less than a year in office. According to the Constitution, to remove a governor from office, a member of the County Assembly forwards a notice supported by at least a third of all members for reasons provided for under Article 181 of the Constitution, which includes gross misconduct, criminal offence, mental or physical incapacitation. We expected Mr. Speaker that somebody would stand and counter Mr. Speaker, that the Moy Stadium, which we clearly indicated that we have evidence that there was corruption to a tune of an extra of 42 million, Mr. Speaker. Move out. No, I won't go. In Wambara's case, 22 out of 33 county assembly members wanted him out. Immediately after Wambara heard of the vote, he sought legal reprieve. It happened on the 23rd of January that Kerogoya High Court Judge Cecilia Gidua granted him a court order to block the resolution to impeach him. Unfortunately for Wambora, Embu House Speaker Justice Karaoke Mate scrutinized the court order papers and found that it did not bear the High Court seal. 
this assembly shall not be injuncted by the purported court order. The only government body that can officially remove Wambora is the Senate, and this happens in various steps while Wambora continues to carry out his gubernatorial duties. According to Article 33 of the County Governments Act, within seven days of the resolution to impeach Wambora, the Embu County Speaker shall forward the notice of resolution to the Speaker of the Senate. The Speaker will then convene a meeting of the Senate to hear charges against the Governor, and the Senate, by resolution, may appoint a special committee comprising of 11 members to investigate the matter. The committee can dismiss the charges if the facts are not substantiated or can proceed to have the governor plead his case in a hearing. All this must be done within 10 days. When the report is presented to the Senate, members will take a vote. If a simple majority finds Wambora guilty, then he will have to leave office and his deputy will fill his vacancy for the rest of the term. If the Senate vote is at an impasse, then the Speaker of the County Assembly must reintroduce the case after three months from the day of the Senate vote. Interestingly, the County Assembly is also in the process of impeaching the Deputy Governor. Catherine Omwando, KTN. Away from Governor Wambora's troubles, upheavals have rocked the Orange Democratic Movement party elections after three contestants pulled out from the polls, citing pressure from the party leadership. MPs John Badi, Dalma Sotiano, and generational change champion Kenobura have dropped out of the ODM leadership race, signaling the power and influence of the old guards over the young Turks at Orange House. Political big man syndrome has calmed the young tax tsunami threatening to sweep across the Orange Party in the forthcoming party elections. In a single day, three contenders for ODM positions from the Luo Nyanza region have bolted out after an apparent riot act from the party leadership. Suba MP John Mbadi and Kisumu Central MP Ken Obura, both contesting for the Secretary General's position, and Rongo MP Dalma Sotieno have shelved their candidature. The course is now clear for a defined contest among Budalangi MP Yababu Namwamba, Senators Dr. Agnes Zani and Elizabeth Ongoro for the SG position. I have decided to put the party above my interests as the party unity and its vision is greater than my interests. I hereby withdraw my candidature forthwith and will henceforth refocus my, ener my energies towards building the party and keeping the real enemies of the party in check. How old are you now? It is a round one win for the old guards, technically knocking out the young tax from the ODM race. The exasperated young tax confidentially say that the ODM party has its owners and they were left with no choice but to pull out of the race after being prevailed upon. But the Rongo MP was quite explicit in his withdrawal statement, citing compliance with the wishes of the party leadership to shelve his bid. All positions are free for everyone, but we cannot gag any person from trying to use any tricks. ODM party leader Raila Odinga has been reprimanded for allegedly meddling with the ODM lineup ahead of the February 28th polls. The undercurrents resultant to the bowing out of candidates puts to test the principle of internal democracy within ODM. The leadership of the party arguing its members had retreated to localization of the party prompting negotiated democracy to give ODM a national outlook. I don't think that uh, what is being exhibited is anything uh, outside normal. ODM their interests. You can even see the party leader is being told uh, somebody feels he can actually play that role uh, better than him. A total of 2,084 delegates meet at the end of February to elect 26 new party officials. The delegates list bearing the controversial limit to women and youth at 20 at the national level instead of 20 each from the 47 branches as indicated in the party's constitution. Other delegates are 17 governors, 16 senators, 95 MPs, 30 National Executive Council members, 564 branch executives, 840 sub-branch executives, and five diaspora members. ODM has extended the deadline for submission of application forms for various positions from the 28th of January to the 31st of January. 71 contestants have so far applied for the positions including former Prime Minister Raila Odinga for the party leader position. Samogina Katian.
trouble for the Orange Party. We are keeping an eye on what's happening at Orange House in the run-up to the party elections, which will be happening from the 28th of February to March 1st. Now, on the big question tonight, more trouble that has been surrounding the multi-billion standard gauge railway uh, tender. We are asking you on the big question, do you think President Uhuru Kenyatta has adequately addressed the issues surrounding the standard gauge railway controversy? Not sample some of your responses here and Yatit Zef says no, the president seems too defensive rather than cutting the curtain of the controversy. Kenyans should move on. Because Sinati Putelezi says it's shameful for the commander in chief of the armed of the defense forces and dusty for, to respond to issues raised by a member of parliament. And another one here from Steve Anjoy who says the president was categorical. The project is long overdue and must continue as we deal with the cartels. All right. Remember, the other thing we want to hear from you about this evening is the Turkana, um, the Turkana situation. Use the hashtag Save Turkana and give us your thoughts on that. I have a few here. Uh, one from uh, Steve Wanjo, who comments on this as well, and he says that the blame game must stop. Something must be done now. We saw this coming. Another one here. This one's a little tongue-in-cheek. Uh, this is Evans Opakasi. He says, I saw Uhuru inviting the press for tea. It should be put on lorries to, to Kana. So, yes, it's a little tongue-in-cheek, but it is a very serious situation. More than 400,000 people affected, 35,000 children out of school because they have to join their parents in looking for food and water. So let us know your thoughts on that. Use the hashtag save Maybe I read just one more, Nancy, uh, mm -hmm. from Ifeo Nakalai. It says, Governor Nanok is not serious. How can he declare disaster five months ago, then plan an emergency meeting tomorrow? Okay, well, give us your thoughts on that. We're going to take a quick break now, but stay with us here on KTN Prime. Many thanks for staying with us. Welcome back to KTN Prime. Now, in a historic ruling today, a Nairobi court has slapped a record sentence on a Chinese national accused of smuggling ivory. Tang Yongchen has been ordered to pay 20 million shillings or go to jail for seven years. Angel Katusia reports. The 40-year-old Chinese national identified as Tang Yong was arrested last week carrying an ivory task weighing 3.4 kilograms in a suitcase while in transit from Mozambique to China via Nairobi. The penalty is a fine of not less than 1 million and a jail term of not less than 5 years. While delivering the sentence, Makadara resident magistrate William Okech said that even though Tang pleaded guilty and expressed remorse over the incident, he could not claim ignorance since ivory trade is a major cause of concern globally. Tang was ordered to pay 20 million shillings or else go to jail for seven years. He has 14 days to appeal the sentence. Tang is the first to be convicted after tougher anti-poaching laws were adopted in the country. Under the new law, which came into force a month ago, dealing in wildlife trophies carries a minimum fine of a million shillings or a minimum jail sentence of five years or both. The Kenya Wildlife Service welcomed the ruling, saying that it has sent a strong message to poachers and those who engage in the illegal trade. The ruling comes just a day after another Chinese national was arrested at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport for allegedly smuggling of 0.3 kilograms of ivory in form of bangles. The man was allegedly found with the lower ivory while on transit from Lubumbashi, DRC, Congo to China. In 2012, 384 elephants were poached in Kenya, up from 289 the previous year. Poaching in the country remained high in 2013. The illegal ivory trade is mostly fueled by demand in Asia and the Middle East, where elephant tusks and rhino horns are used to make ornaments and in traditional medicines. Angel Katusa, KTN. So there you have it, Ben, just a little over three kilos.
and you get seven years in jail or, or 20, 20 million, million shillings. shillings. I'd that's say nice. that's a pretty strong warning to other people. While you're watching Katie and Prime, don't forget our big queue this evening. We're asking you whether you think that President Uhuru actually adequately addressed the issues surrounding the standard gauge railway project. Ben, what are the people saying? Here are some of the views. Kakai Joffrey says President was talking as a politician too defensive. Master Juma says he should name the cartel so that we can have faith on the project and Juma Kisa says who are these powerful people who even the president cannot name okay. of course we were talking about our top story is what is happening in Turkana famine and drought there more than 30,000 people have fled to neighboring Uganda we had asked you what your views are on Twitter hashtag save Turkana let's take a look at that right now uh, we've got Dennis Chesoni, who says, shame on you, government. Turkana is next to Transoya and Wasingishu, the food baskets. And uh, we've also got another one here from Njoki Shkola, who says, if the government can airlift people from Sudan, why is it so hard to airlift food to Turkana? And another one here from Ifeoma who's Kalai, who says, Governor Nanok is not serious. How can he declare a disaster five months ago? and then plan an emergency meeting tomorrow. Don't forget to use the hashtag Save Turkana. We'll take a look at some more of your responses later on. While you're watching KTN Prime, thank you for staying with us here. We'll take on a quick break, but don't go too far. Nancy will be back with the day's business. You're watching KTN Prime. Time now to get down to business and we start with a quick question. How many of you can actually say which matatus go to Imara Daima off the top of your head without having to ask someone? Now, try the same for Utawala and Ruai and Ongata Rongai and Gidunguri. Now, assume you're describing the route to someone. Which would you say are the major stops that one would expect on these roads? Well, it does turn out that you don't have to memorize these things anymore thanks to Africa's first ever public transit map. The new system launched Launched by the Kenya Alliance of Residents Association allows you to access all this information and more at the touch of a button. Adelaide Changole tells us more. Chaos, pandemonium, disorder. These are the words that have been used to describe Kenya's transport system. And the chief culprits so far have been the matatus that have been accused of deliberately raking what was once a properly running system. Uh, because of the confusion that has characterized the transport sector, it has become extremely difficult for people to plan. In fact, if you want to hold a conference in the morning in Nairobi, there is a standard excuse that why people have come late, it's because of the traffic jam. And this state of affairs has translated to a higher cost of living for residents who have to pay higher fares to access services in addition to wasting crucial man hours sitting in choking traffic. But whilst it has made the city, which is a financial and logistics hub of East Africa, unfavorable for tourists and visitors, they choose to give the city a wide berth despite its sights and sounds, a fact that has raised concern from all players in the sector. We all must work together to create a system that works for our city. And this has come in the form of an Nairobi public transit map, which has mapped out all the Matatu routes in the city in a bid to make commuting a little less hectic for residents and visitors alike. Dubbed the digital Matatu, the system also monitors traffic on major city roads and will allow commuters to establish how heavy the traffic on specific roads is through their mobile phones and thereby avoid choking jams. Or you can even be able to locate where there is heavy jam and if we can be able to synchronize and integrate this information with our CCTV system, which we are going to launch soon, then we can even be able to, to, to guide our traffic marshals. The Nairobi County government says it will use the data provided by the system to create policies around traffic management in the city. But the Ministry of Transport wants the county government to go beyond formulating policies to also enforcing them. As we implement the new PSV licenses, any operator who does not follow the bylaws will face the consequences. The new project is expected to make the process of moving around easier and more enjoyable to both city residents and to visitors. 
Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. The KCB Group has signed an 850 million shilling financing deal with USAID and General Electric to small and medium enterprises for the development of private health facilities, including diagnostic centers and hospitals in Kenya. Now, the deal is geared towards responding to the lack of local credit for health facilities in Kenya to purchase much needed equipment in response to increasing demand for medical and diagnostic imaging services in the private sector. The risk sharing agreement between USAID and KCB will allow KCB to take additional lending risks for clients in the health sector that are seeking to purchase General Electric equipment. The agreement with KCB specifically covers access to financing for a range of GE healthcare, healthcare equipment. Content and uh, and we're, we're thrilled to continue to work with our partners and, and uh, watch this business grow based on really delivering great infrastructure solutions uh, for the region. Inadequate and inaccurate information from the country's meteorological department has been blamed for the declining productivity in Kenya's breadbasket. A group of scientists calling themselves the Consumer Unit and Trust Society are now warming, warning of an imminent reduction in May's productivity by up to 10 million bags this year following the lack of timely weather information to farmers. Here's KTN's Philip Ketanyi with a report. The risk associated with extreme weather condition brought about by climate change continue to affect the country's agricultural productivity in spite of strides in the meteorological services. The system to warn farmers on climate change are inadequate, leaving them exposed. Certainly one thing is clear. Climate change is here and it's here to stay. In 2011, the country witnessed the worst food insecurity crisis which saw over 4 million people put on food aid. Farmers continued to suffer huge losses as a result of poor prediction and timely dissemination of weather information, especially at the onset and cessation of rains. Early warning systems as uh, a critical challenge that uh, farmers in Kenya face in terms of enhancing agricultural productivity, which directly impacts on their livelihoods as well as uh, trade. Farmers have also decried poor information sharing methods by the Ministry of Environment, Water and Natural Resources through the Kenya Meteorological Services. Things are getting worse by the day. And therefore, if we sit back and continue doing things the same way we've done them all the years, then expecting different results, we're certainly not going to get anywhere. Concern has also been raised on whether information is complex to most farmers who find it hard to interpret with proposals to have information disseminated through mobile phones for quick action. Philip Keitan, KTN Business. Local coffee shop operator Art Cafe has confirmed the acquisition of Dorman's coffee shops across the country. In the joint venture type acquisition, Art Cafe will operate specific shops which will continue to operate under the Dorman's brand. In the deal, which both companies were not able to confirm its worth, Art Cafe will embark on an operational development planning process that will involve the redesigning of Dorman's outlets, refreshing of the menu, and an upgrading of the decor and customer experience. The move is seen as strategic to maintain the core clientele in the lower middle class market, while Art Cafe continues to target its core upper middle class segment. Both companies did not disclose whether there is a revenue share agreement in the new deal. Now, as part of the expansion strategy, Art Cafe plans to open a 250-seater restaurant at The Oval, a new commercial complex in Nairobi, as well as a Dorman's coffee shop in the same building. Let's now take a look at what went up and what went down in our financial report.
Now, shocking news from Turkana County where KTN has established that two elderly women feasted on dog meat late last week after they were left with no alternative as fear looms of a massive starvation in the northern county. Villagers found the two women feeding on roasted dog meat in a hut, prompting them to alert local administration. Turkana County Police Commander Jonathan Gala confirmed the incident. The last few weeks has seen Turkana residents walk for long distances in search of water as the county has experienced no rainfall in the last few months. A looming famine appears inevitable as experts predict a long dry spell in the coming several weeks. That is our, our top story and we are still seeking your views on the same as we keep our tabs on that developing story for you via our social media platforms. On Twitter, the hashtag is save to kind of tell us what you think. Time now to take a look at what's happening in sports. Let me now take you to KTN's Lynn Washira in the sports studio. Lynn, they are the English Premier League returns this Tuesday night and I know Kenyan football fans are waiting eagerly. What else is happening in sports? Uh, thank you, Ben. And uh, of course, we have another action-packed edition of KTN Sports today where we have news from cricket, athletics, football, and all the sports. But that is after a short break. Do stay with us. Stealing from the Pope, what did the Vatican thieves get away with? Adrenaline builds as the Volleyball World Cup final qualifiers beckons. You're watching KTN Prime. Well, a very good evening and a warm welcome to KTN Sports today. I'm Lynn Washira. We kick off the bulletin with some volleyball news where the journey to the World Feminine Championships has never been long for the Kenyan team. The African champions moved to residential training camp on Friday to prepare for the final World Cup Group 2 qualifier, which Kenya will host from mid this month at Kasarani. Victor Ogale witnessed the team's epic training regime at Kasarani this morning and chronicles the making of champions. Braxidis Sagala is one of the senior national team players in the country. She has been to a couple of world championships and one Olympic Games. Just like Braxidis, who is a middle blocker, her colleagues have endured. This training regime characterized by rigorous intervals since the beginning of last year. The African queens are midway through their journey to the world championships, according to coach David Lungaho. In as much as it is an energy-sapping exercise, it is the only way to mold a winning team. It has been too much for us, but because uh, the championship is there and we have to participate, because we don't want to let our country down, we have to do it. But I can assure you that uh, the players are fatigued. The tournament which Kenya will host brings together seven top African nations, each eyeing the single slot set aside for Africa at the World Championships in Italy. Kenya is in pole B alongside Seychelles, Uganda, Tunisia, Senegal, Mozambique and Cape Verde. Oh, the team is familiar with their competitors having defeated them during past qualifiers, though Lungaho says that they will not take chances. We are hoping that they are going to come uh, later this week or later towards the end of the week and then they will have more time to recover. Uh, we'll be doing only one session or two sessions of two hours, two hours. The 2014 FIVB Women's World Championships will be held in Italy in October. The men's equivalent will be held in Poland in August. The 24 ready qualified teams are drawn on Monday pending the determination of the African representative. The African qualifiers will be known after the final round set for Nairobi next week. The national women's volleyball team is a living example of a team that understands the sole duty of donning national colors. And for now, their sole focus is on their six qualifying matches for the world championships. Victor Ogale, KTN Kasarani, Nairobi. Thank you, Victor, for that report. And moving on, Kenya Commercial Bank has given a clean bill of health to the Kenya Motorsports Federation by renewing and improving its sponsorship for the 2014 season. The season opens in Malindi this weekend, where 42 drivers are scheduled to battle for top honors. The bank signed off a 43.5 million shillings check for the new season. 
The current hot and dusty condition are just but some of the challenges the 42 rally drivers and their navigators will have to contend with this weekend during the first leg of the 2014 Kenya National Rally Championships. It will be a nostalgic moment for the residents of Malindi. The region has not witnessed rally action for over 25 years and with temperatures expected to be above 38 degrees Celsius, it will require bravery and resilience from the participating crew. The course is a mixture of uh, fast, uh, hilly and twisty sections. The 2013 champion Baldev Chaga and his navigator Ravi Soni will be seeking to make a good start while knowing that each of the 42 competitors is seeking to spoil the party for them. The event will have a total distance of 350 kilometers, punctuated by six competitive stages. Experienced Ian Duncan, Carl Tundo and Quentin Michel are other elite drivers set to kick the dust. There are other muted mamas last year about KCB's faith in the Kenya Motorsport Federation, but the banker's injection of 43.5 million shillings was enough sign to indicate clean bill of health. I am confident that drivers and fans will enjoy an exciting and safe rally this season. And I plead to all our spectators as usual, keep it safe, keep it fun, just come in and enjoy uh, the rally. First runners up last year, Ian Duncan, is the driver to watch this season alongside Carl Tundo and Quintin Michal. Moses Swahisi, KTN Sports. And Kenya's hopes of qualifying for her fifth Cricket World Cup ended this morning when the national team lost narrowly to the United Arab Emirates. The UAE won the match by 13 runs. UAE put into bat was struggling at 82 for 4 before they were rescued by their captain Kuram Khan who stabilized the innings by scoring 85 runs. He was removed in the 43rd over but his replacement Amjad Javed ingested more energy by adding 63 runs of 31 deliveries to lift the team to 2.46 for 8. The seamer Nehemiah Othiambo picked up four wickets for Kenya. The majority of Kenya's batting order all made starts, but none of the batsmen were able to convert them into a 50 as wickets fell at regular intervals right from the start. Colin Sabuya and Maurice Ouma's 77 run stand for the fifth wicket gave the team more some hope, but facing an ever increasing required run rate, they were eventually bowled out for 233 in 49.3 overs. And finally, Borussia Mönchengladbach striker Luke De Jong is traveling to Newcastle for medical and is expected to join the club on an initial loan deal. He could make his debut in Saturday's Tyneware derby against Premier League rivals Sunderland. There are three days remaining before the English Premier League transfer window closes. Elsewhere, Cardiff's Peter Odemwingui joins Stoke in a swap deal that takes Porter striker Kenry Jones the other way. Sunderland head coach Gus Poyet says he's close to signing Argentine Ignacio's Coco with a striker set for a medical. And remaining with the EPL, Arsenal could extend their lead on the table should they win away to Southampton. The focus will be on title holders Manchester United who welcome Cardiff City at Old Trafford. Fourth place Liverpool welcome Everton as Newcastle United play away to Norwich City. Swansea welcomes Fulham as Crystal Palace entertain Hull at home. And that does it for tonight's edition of KTN Sports Today. I'm Lynn Washira. Do have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your viewing and keep it KTN. Right, we end tonight with a somewhat bizarre turn of events, don't we? Ben? Italian police say thieves broke into a church and stole a vial containing the blood of the late Pope John Paul II.
The police launched a major search operation involving sniffer dogs and dozens of officers, but few clues were found. Police believe theft was commissioned because no other items of value were taken, but they also said it would be difficult to sell the vial and they are not really sure what the thieves were planning to do with it. Now, the Catholic Church is due to make Pope John Paul II a saint in April. He died in 2005. So tonight we had two opinion polls. We are first of all we are talking about the uh, controversy ravaged Standard Gauge Railway. When we are asking you on the big question, do you think President Uhuru Kenyatta has done enough to uh, make sure to address issues surrounding the Standard Gauge Railway? And this is your poll, Nancy. Results? Well, we have 31 percent of you saying yes and 69 percent of you saying no. Looks like some more answers are still required. Ben, uh, let's take a look at the tweets. Why don't we? Indeed, Nancy. And let me. There's a tweet here. A tweet here, rather, from. Uh one Donya Michael who says that the project is laudable, but if the process is being hijacked by some forces, the president should explain this to Kenyans. Another one here, linking that to the Turkana story, Kim Skiari says, wish the standard gauge railway funds could be diverted to solve the Turkana farming crisis. And yet, and, and another one here, Caleb Mutua says, no, the president only buried the issue under the carpet. He should have halted the process and ordered thorough investigations. And the last one here from, uh, from Rono, who says, yes, Aria, yes, he says, Uhuru Kenyatta is just about to fulfill his promises to the people of Kenya, so let him go ahead. All right, well, let's take a look at what you had to say about Save Turkana. Victor Ambuli says, for how long will our so-called leaders continue to wait for the fourth estate to highlight crises like these? And Maureen Elavisa says, Kenya has, a, has poor disaster management and preparation. Our priorities are just messed up and it's the citizens who feel the pain. Kavita says, what is the governor thinking about in the name of development if the people are dying of hunger? First things first, save to Okana. Well, thank you very much for your responses this evening. It was great to have you joining us for KTN Prime. We'll have to say goodnight for now. I am Nancy Kachingira. Hope to see you tomorrow. I have to remind you that we shall keep uh, following that story in Turkana for you. So do keep it, KTN. My name is Ben Kitili. Have a wonderful night.